Victorian Periodical Parade. Hey. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, it's been a it's been a very snowy week in Texas, so we haven't gone anywhere for the last four days. <laughs> it's very strange. Cool. Cool. You ready to hit record? I am. Cool. I'm actually recording right now. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I'll just do it three ways. Perfect. Just just because. I don't want to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> this, I don't want to do it for a third time. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Victorian Periodical Parade. Today we are going to be doing the breakdown episode of Aunt Agatha's Husband. Here today is Daniel Casper, PhD again. Hi. Hey. Oh, it's good to be back. <laughs> good. Good to see you. So I'm, I'm, we're not going to pretend that we didn't do this already. And I'm, like, I'm try, I've been trying to remember what we talked about the last time we tried to talk about Aunt Agatha's husband. Mm. And I, I'll, I'll be happy to say that I've lost every bit of it. <laughs> well, that's good enough. Because, so. you know... I mean, even last time we talked about it and it was just off the dome. So, you know, right. your knowledge from your profession and my knowledge from reading it and listening to it multiple times. I. Ooh, you wrote Wait, it. I hadn't out. read it again. There you go. There you go. <laughs> One thing that I think we had a discrepancy on last time was whether or not the narrator started out as one person and then became a different person. What did you think upon this reading? Okay, so I'm reading it again. So this narration is actually quite strange. Yes. Because it's Aunt Agatha's niece. Yep. Who I think is actually unnamed in the story. Because, like, she's got two sisters who she's constantly, who are constantly talking and she's talking about them. Yes. But she's the third sister and doesn't have a name. Yes. It's really weird to ha this viewpoint character is actually quite strange to be like, I'm telling you this story about my aunt and my grandparents' death and my aunt's new marriage to who turns out to be like a, a shady character from Australia. Yep. And so like, it's this very gossipy, here's this thing that happened to me, not even to me, here's this thing that yep. happened in my family yep. kind of story. It's kind of like a family um, history. It is, mm -hmm. in a weird way, because you're like, who's, who's she talking to exactly? Yes. Very unclear. Like, is this a story that she's telling to her uh, child? Is this a story that she's... She's obviously not telling the story to her sisters. They're there, they're yep. experiencing it with her. So where the story exists sort of in, in conversation seems a little strange, just to begin with. I was thinking maybe her diary... Like, maybe. Maybe like, it was just she's writing it down and practicing how to write... And then all of a sudden, yeah. she just gets this thread of a story. But yeah, the very Maybe. beginning was the swap of the description of the title, right? Right. Yeah. There's this opening. There's this opening paragraph that is very philosophical and yes. very sort of wide view of narration. Yep. Like that seems to be omniscient and no thing. So like when you talk about poor people and mm -hmm. poor James and poor Mary and all of these sorts of things, you can read that as coming from the little girl. Mm -hmm. Or actually, she's a teenager, really, more yeah. than she's a little girl. But then she, like, arrives as an I. Like, the <laughs> I version of the self appears in the yep. second paragraph. Yep. So, in a very strange sort of way, if we're reading this, like, as written down in a periodical, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as we as we do in this, in this podcast. Yep. So, like, she's telling the story to the readers of a magazine in a very... It starts off in a very magazine sort of voice. Thank Here you. is this sort of general abstract thing about human beings and here's this very personal narrative anecdote i have about mm -hmm. somebody who seemed quite poor and is not at all mm -hmm. it's funny to begin the story talking about poor aunt agatha and why aunt agatha is poor is that she's treated like a child yes. for 40 years by her mother and then she gets rich and then mm -hmm. she inherits all the money mm -hmm. um, becomes really wealthy and then marries mr smith mm -hmm. mr smythe we're unclear on that. Yep. And falls in love and it's beautiful and mm -hmm. happy. And we're supposed to sort of, there's this sense, I remember we're talking about this, because of the other stuff that we were going to juggle and hide together. And because you're reading Lady Oddly's Secret, yeah. I'm reading this short story waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yes. I'm waiting for some mm -hmm. bad thing to happen. There seems like it's leading towards Aunt Agatha being like left to the altar or ruined or conned out of all of her money or whatever. <laughs> and that doesn't happen. Nope. <laughs> she marries the 
guy. Turns out he might be crooked. If he is, it doesn't matter because they're happy together for <laughs> until she dies. Yep. So I won't say that the story is pointless because, but the story seems like it's headed for a punchline yes. that doesn't ever actually arrive. Yep. And that was something that Kari also noticed with the other ghost stories in this book. They're not necessarily ghost stories and they're not you know, the predetermined punchline that you would, you could assume, which is really interesting of this author. What? It intrigues me. Yes, good, good. I am intrigued by Catherine Lord, who Yay. I've <laughs> never heard of aside from this. Yep, so exactly. I had to look her up again. Mm-hmm. She wrote under a pseudonym, Lucy Hardy. Our Lady of Hate collection is the first time her short stories have ever been reprinted. Mm-hmm. And they're reprinted 120 years after she died. Yep. So she's what has been called a lost Victorian ghostwriter. Mm-hmm. And so apparently fully developed her writing skills after her husband's death as a way of making money. Yeah. And is also quite a good writer. Like yeah. to read this short story, you're like, this is not, she didn't become obscure because she's a bad author. Like there are definitely bad authors out yes. there. And they even, there are even famous authors that I have read as a, a study, a student of Victorian. And I'm like, this is bad. <laughs> yeah. Like some of it. <laughs> Bad. It's like this got this published because of your good. name. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And Some of that, like Edward Bulwer Lytton, was considered better than Dickens, and he's mm-hmm. just not very good at writing. Wow. But this is actually quite good, yeah. which is surprising, again, that we I'd never heard of her before. Yeah. But as it happens, the a periodical sort of culture means that a lot of this stuff is kind of disposable, mm-hmm. like in a in a uh, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I mean, like, literally, it's, it gets thrown away yeah. and then no one, no one pays attention to it. So because of the way periodical press uh, this is work, like, they're, you know, mass entertainment. They're meant to be sort of ephemeral. They're printed on cheap paper and they disappear. In order to find them, in order to find actual pieces from the time, you have to do a whole lot of digging yeah. through a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. That's what Johnny Maines, the editor of this collection, has been doing, is mm-hmm. finding obscure women writers and trying to bring them back yeah which has been pretty cool because he's got three books now that i know of are really interesting this one is specifically Catherine lord but then he has another one that's a smattering of authors that were lost to time we were going to record uh, an episode together but he was like ah oh, man my schedule is booked because i'm gonna go research this weekend and i was like yeah. okay well let me know when uh, you're ready next time and hopefully it'll be in in the next couple of months but who knows everybody's busy <laughs> Yeah, everybody's busy. But so yeah, so Johnny Maine's been like literally pawing through mm-hmm. I hope I hope he's been pawing through digitized versions of this because actually doing it with the real paper would be annoying. Yeah. Honestly. Well, cause <laughs> I I can't remember if I told you this last time, but um I pulled out some newspapers from our wall because our mm-hmm. our house was insulated in nineteen forty and the newspapers were from 1939 and I pulled them out and they're really fragile. And then now that they've dried in 2020 air, they're even more fragile. And one of them right. just disintegrated. Like I grabbed it yeah. and it just <laughs> fell to pieces. And I was yeah. like, Oh, exactly. Yeah. Because they're not meant to be, this is the thing. Paper is not particularly um, robust yes. as a material. It's not like we're carving stuff into stone, mm-hmm. but then and additionally, the kind of paper you would use for a newspaper periodical is not, not quality stuff because yep. you have to be using so much of it yep. that you're not going to invest in you know acid free ink or whatever oh, yeah. and so shoving it in a wall <laughs> for you know 70 years is not great for the paper in general no. but also the paper would not have stood up to this standard of time oh, anyway yeah. like, just leaving it on a shelf too it would yeah. we've also found some that have been in the attic and they've been folded and they were like deformed to be in that fold shape and as you try to take it out you crack it yeah yeah and it's just, wow. so Catherine lord mm-hmm. <laughs> is printed on this sort of paper yeah. dies and so she disappears into the obscure lost history of time mm-hmm. <laughs> obscurity which is what happens when a writer doesn't have a champion yes. after they've gone mm-hmm. essentially so a lot of the famous writers that we know of 
had patrons or they had like oh. uh, literary executors who spent a lot of energy yes. after they were gone promoting their work. One of the things that makes it difficult to make it as a writer is that you have to have people reading you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have somebody convincing people to be reading you all the time, you can just, you know, disappear into the ether. And so she dies. She's never had anything published in a book form. Yes. So because of that there wasn't it's not like she was sitting on a library shelf somewhere mm -hmm. waiting for somebody to pick her up and be like oh this is amazing mm -hmm. it's not like this is what happened to herman melville like oh. he printed all his books he printed all his books as books and then he fell into obscurity after his death and then he was rediscovered in the library essentially by americanists and now he's one of the greatest writers of all time nice. uh, catherine lord might be one of the greatest writers of the 21st century having died in 1901 yes yeah so, Kari has the bound editions of the London Journal. Very cool. And so, I don't know that Catherine Lord was published in the London Journal, but maybe she was at one point. That would be something we'd have to look for. Exactly. But that's what I'm also thinking about is, you know, they published a book, a bound copy, for every year of the mm -hmm. London Journal, but they also probably published a bound copy of many other magazines enough other magazines that the number of short stories that you're going to be able to find is already in the tens of thousands and you have to luck oh, into sure. finding Lucy Hardy and wanting to find more of her just like yeah. Johnny Mains did so he's the champion now which is great and I have a appreciation for him because yeah these short stories are well written yeah yeah so there's a lot of bound mm -hmm. copies of stuff yeah. there's there were we say periodical and we say magazine and that's sort of what they are there but they're often also like dickens's yearly annual book yes was a periodical it was a magazine but it was bound in actual as an actual book and given away as presents as gifts yes so there's so they're slightly more robust yes. in their construction because they're meant to be presented to other people yeah so it's the equivalent <laughs> this is gonna be very goofy but i love lucy the tv show sure. invented the rerun oh, because yeah. lucy and desi just filmed themselves producing the tv show because most oh. television episodes were just beamed directly oh they yeah weren't recorded in any fashion but they put a film camera on the tv camera and could film all wow. of it and therefore ended up inventing the rerun because, because they, they had to reproduce the film. their same thing yeah, but no one was doing... Like, the only reason they did that is because they wanted their kids to see them acting as, you know, yeah. young couple. Like, it was literally just one person deciding to maintain the copies of stuff that allows us to have I Love Lucy. Well, in the periodical press, the only thing... That, the things that we have are the things that people kept, the things that people yes. spent the energy to bind. Some, like, you could literally go to a bookseller and bind your favorite magazine if you wanted to. But also, like, keeping them clean, keeping them safe, uh, keeping them from being, like, water damaged or caught on fire. Yeah. Is a function of people enjoying the actual thing and keeping it sort of on their own. Like, they aren't designed for that, but by, like, sheer willpower, the, like, pack rat nature of a human being, <laughs> we have a lot of them left, luckily to be digitized and then yes. to be read yeah. and then to be, you know republish now mm -hmm. yeah yeah like you were saying somebody could have potentially kept it in a steamer trunk that slowly got pushed further and further back into the attic and then water and fire <laughs> needed to not happen in that house or that yeah. apartment building for it to now be coming out when great grandma yeah. passes in 99 someone had to want to go through great grandma's yes like collection of comic books essentially mm -hmm. is what it is yeah and look for them and find good stuff mm -hmm. and then take the energy and say this is good stuff mm -hmm. other people should read it yeah. we should make this a thing yep exactly and so luckily there are such things professional nerds like <laughs> academics yes. like johnny mates yes. who's going out there and finding stuff mm -hmm. that we get to then read mm -hmm. so aunt agatha's husband yes is very uh odd mm -hmm story in the sense that uh, we talked about it not having a punchline but like the actual content of the story is a little strange so we have a couple of key players mm -hmm. our narrator who's sort of constantly looking down on aunt agatha like the whole family seems to um sort of condescend yes. to her because she's a little naive she's been mm -hmm. like living under her her mother's so the narrator's grandmother but 
Agatha's mom's, like, dictatorial rule. And so great-grandma is apparently in charge of everything yes. and has kept Aunt Agatha at home for 40 years and not allowed her to grow up. Oh. So, like, there's a point where Aunt Agatha's bedroom hasn't apparently changed since she was a child. Mm-hmm. And the, when the lawyer tells her how much money she has... Um, <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I don't know what to do with any of this stuff. After the death of the grandmother, she lives the same life for years, not changing anything at all because she doesn't know what to do, what to change. There's a strange part where when she gets married, yes. the family lawyer says it's a good thing that all the capital is tied up. Mm-hmm so that nobody can access um, the actual money. So Aunt Agatha is living on interest, Mm -hmm. basically, and rent, probably. Yes. Which is a fascinating sort of Victorian thing to do, and it must mean that she has quite a bit of money. These are actually quite really, really wealthy people, so wealthy that they don't actually have to use the capital. They can live on the interest rates instead. And I think they said something about the land was also vast. So like you said, it could be that they have multiple renters that even the niece doesn't know about. Yeah, she's a landlord. Like, what is it that when the grandfather dies and grandmother dies almost immediately afterwards... Mm -hmm. Aunt Agatha sat listening to the patient explanations of the old family lawyer, who vainly endeavored to make clear to her confused understanding the mysteries of rents and leases, oh, investments and yes. shares, checks, and bankers' passbooks. There you so go. she's got bank. Like, Aunt Agatha is rolling in money. <laughs> so she's gone from being poor Agatha to really, really wealthy Agatha. Lady Agatha. <laughs> Lady Agatha. And apparently what makes Agatha happy is marrying Mr. Smith, Mr. Smythe, um, who is... I will probably... I'm going to go with the interpretation that he's a bad person. Like, I'm going to go ahead and say he probably defrauded some banks. Because there's no way of knowing for sure. Yeah. It's really unclear. It's definitely not... It doesn't rise to the level of anything beyond gossip. Yes. But the entire story is gossip. Yeah. Like the whole, yeah. like, the gossip level on of, gossip like, on... yeah, the level of proof and evidence yeah. that we have is very, very slim anyway. Yeah. So Mr. Smith or Mr. Smart is accused of robbing a bank or defrauding a bank, so probably writing hot checks yes. more than anything else. By the, is it the cousin who comes back? Yes. I can't remember the... The narrator's cousin. Yeah. Oh, no, I forgot. So before Mm -hmm. he comes back, uh, Aunt Agatha goes on her first vacation ever. Yes. And then meets Mr. Smith. Apparently they expected the neighbors to be, like, chaperoning her to make sure that she doesn't get into trouble, (laughs) which is such a weird thing to do for a 40-year-old woman. Mm -hmm. But it's also a very Victorian thing. So she meets him on, like, a whirlwind romance in Italy Mm -hmm. or wherever and marries him that day it sounds like they've, they've known each other for a couple of days yeah. and then they go get married a, a very short um, period yeah, yeah so and then the rumors about mr smythe's check hot, hot cash check thingy comes out mm-hmm. <laughs> i assure you that your aunt stood up quite coolly and told us she had married a convict as if she expected us to congratulate instead of console with her mm-hmm. and you're like Wow, mom, that's real bitchy. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> oh man, I only knew the story yesterday. Yes. Okay, so Agatha doesn't know about it until Jim tells her, buddy, mm-hmm. and she finds it out. And Mr. Smith, Mr. Smythe, tells her yeah, she's before like, somebody else can, which is hmm. pretty. Like, yeah, he he gets her aside and says, "This is a thing that happened. I don't want to hear any rumors." Uh, this is from me, and Agatha says, "I believe I'm quite innocent." And yeah. this is the part where I'm like. Is he innocent? Is Aunt Agatha really naive and sort of just believing what he has to say? And so that's, again, the part where the story seems like it's setting her up yes, to be defrauded, exactly. to have all of her leases taken away. But it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So we can never know if he was innocent or not. Right. It turns out that he turns out to be quite a fine husband. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't seem to be a problem. Yep. So, like, we don't actually see him do anything bad. We can only just hear the speculation yes. and the rumors and we why. hear it from the narrator's cousin who right. was at the thing in australia but definitely recognized yeah him. exactly they both saw each other mm-hmm. and definitely knew each other was happening and so certainly there's the only thing we can say for sure is there are definitely rumors about yeah. he was accused of doing something bad in australia which is funny on its own level yes but um that accusation is the highest level of 
proof that we have. We don't have any, like, it, no one went to trial over it. Yeah. So we don't see him do anything bad. Yes. We only hear about it multiple sources away from, yes. like, the narrator. And so my assumption is that, yes, he was writing some hot checks and got caught. Yeah. But he turns out to be just a fine husband anyway, so what does it matter on that level? Exactly, because, like, the levels of crimes you could commit in Australia and then be yeah. taken to court over... You could kill people. You could steal animals. Yeah, writing sure. a check, sheep wrestling, while you're at a writing bank, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. is like, like I eh. need money. I was working there. Something happened. Some something check happened. went through, and somebody found out that it was wrong. Blah blah blah. It's not the worst thing no, to be. That's just pure capital crimes. And, and so then you come things. back and you find somebody you who's back. got money, and you're like, oh, I don't have to worry about money anymore cool that i'm no longer stressed about this yes so we are laughing about australia because australia designated as a penal colony yes. the initial thing so you do something bad in england mm-hmm. and then they'd send you to australia and if you were got you came back usually it was something like seven years or wow. you know life yes and so you'd have to never come back if you were ever caught in england they would hang you you'd be dead wow and so lots of people were sent to australia they were also lots of people were also sent to the americas in penal colonies as punishment Mm -hmm. for really kind of minor stuff like stealing a handkerchief kind of deal oh gosh um you can get in trouble you can get in trouble yeah i think it's in i think it's an oliver twist where they're stealing handkerchiefs and that's enough that is enough to get the artful dodger sent off to australia forever oh wow yeah they're not fair-minded punishments no 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 so it's funny that Mr. Smith is got in trouble in Australia for doing something and has returned to Europe in order to escape the shame of being being accused of something. Yep. And then when he's in Europe, he's a good person. Yep. Like definitely doesn't do anything bad mm-hmm. while he's here. So there's some there's some really weird relationship between the penal colony as the outside yes. and the sort of empire central London as the like uh, metropole of place where all of the yeah. all of the good things the decisions are made and all of that kind of stuff so that's quite funny they were also talking about how Smythe was his England name but he changed it to yeah. Smith while he was in Australia to make it easier right. and then when he came yeah. back to England he went back to Smythe. Smythe and so he could have been hiding twice you know what I mean yeah yeah for sure well okay so obviously Smith is a really, you know, generic name. It's very much a John Doe sort of level. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to commit crimes, commit it under the name Smith, because Mm -hmm. there's lots of them. That's another point against Agatha's sort of worldliness, Mm -hmm. that she just immediately Mm -hmm. believes that, oh yeah, he definitely didn't change his name to Smith. He just, it was just an accident and it was easier just to leave it alone than it was to actually correct somebody on the proper spelling of his name. And there's a moment where the narrator's mother is a little worried that they've married under the wrong name and therefore the the marriage isn't legal anymore. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because if you write the wrong name on the, if you write the wrong name in front of the priest, or you say the wrong name in front of the priest, you're not officially married. So there's you reading Lady Audley's secret. Mm-hmm. There's another book by Mary E. Braden. It's called The Golden Calf, and it's yes. about a young woman who marries one cousin, thinking he's the rich cousin, and he turns out to be the poor cousin. Oh. And so they very carefully make sure to say his name the poor cousin says his name properly in front of the priest so that she's actually married to him not the other cousin whose name he shares it's also it's a really good book you should read it yeah Uh, (laughs) (laughs) so like there's a very specific sort of legal requirement that you have to make sure that you're not you can't marry under a pseudonym you have to marry under your actual name or it's not legal yep so like if (laughs) if mr smythe is trying to con Aunt Agatha out of her money, which is not an impossibility yes. at the beginning, for sure. Uh, he's going about it in a very clever sort of way to make sure that he's actually in charge of the money, yes. which is why the lawyer's like, it's a good thing everything's in a trust. It can't be touched. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, even- <laughs> all he's doing is maybe he, well, he could have raised the rents, right? Yeah. He's skimming off the top, yeah. maybe. But, you know, he's married to her. Yeah. It's like his money too now because they're married. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what he does with it is sort of like, that's the danger. Yeah. The danger of having Aunt Agatha be the naive little girl. But that's also part of like this lasting legacy of the grandmother, right? Yes. So like the reason Aunt Agatha doesn't know what a check is, mm-hmm. is because the grandmother gave her uh, pocket money for pins her entire life. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> treats her like a four-year-old. Yep. 
till she's 40. <laughs> and so, like, there's this na- naivete that, like, sing- hangs around Aunt Agatha, and everybody in the, you know, all the family calls her poor Agatha because they look down on her for being slightly innocent, naive, simple, maybe, maybe kind of dumb. Mm. They, they think of her that way. Yep. But then, you know what? Aunt Agatha marries Mr. Smythe. This strapping Australian man has a, the time of her life, like living in living it up in Italy, living on grandma's rent yeah. and stuff. And who's who's the winner? Who's the winner at the end of the story? Well, it's Agatha. Agatha's yeah. the one. Well, yeah, they're both win, right? Like, yeah. And then there was also a point where the narrator said she got to go on the trip to Italy, and yeah. the narrator was like, "That is a trip that we will likely never get to take." Yes. yes. Okay, so there's a clearly some tension here between mm-hmm. Agatha and the mother of the story, yes. because the narrator's mother, because Agatha's the one who ended up with all the money. Mm-hmm. So, like, where the all these leases and rents um, could have come to the uh, narrator and their family, yes. it actually ends up with Aunt Agatha, who's single, not unmarried, doesn't have any children. So there's some... Part of the reason why the mom is so eager to tell mm-hmm. Aunt Agatha that her husband's a convict is because she's jealous of the yes. fact that Aunt Agatha has money, like, is able to go to Italy, is able to go bag a strapping young husband, like yep. a rent boy, basically. It comes full circle back to what we <laughs> talked does. about in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Jealousy. Oh, yeah? Right? Jealousy. Yeah. Everything. Every Human beings, like, wanting stuff that they're not supposed to have. Mm-hmm. And then Aunt Agatha gets out and wins. Yeah. Like, if we were to take this, and we would call this the opposite of Jekyll. Like this oh, is, yeah, absolutely. She gets She's everything that she fine. likes. Yeah. She gets fine. And the, the narrator gets, you know, nothing. She gets to live on a property without paying yeah. rent, I think. But so without paying rent, to the narrator's credit, she doesn't. The narrator herself doesn't seem to be particularly jealous of or cruel, Agatha's yeah. money or cruel. But the that's part of okay. So the narrator seems to be sort of telling us the story in a, in a sort of neutral tone, yeah. So that the mom's sort of like poisonous yes. anger towards Aunt Agatha is sort of thrown into relief. So we're not the narrator doesn't tell us that the mom is jealous of Mm -hmm. Aunt Agatha's money. She just implies it by allowing the mother to talk. Yes. So the mom, so we get all of the anger simply from what it is that the mom has to say. Mm -hmm. I know that according to all Orthodox traditions, Mr. Smythe should have soon thrown off the mask and made Aunt Agatha miserable for the rest of her days. So the narrator knows, this is the other thing, the narrator knows that we're expecting the punchline too. Yes. And explicitly tells us that even though, like, traditionally this would be what happens, and Agatha's fine. Yeah. Like the like the story has a happy ending because apparently there is no mask. Maybe George Smythe is the real person that he says he is. He is innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. And it's the sort of outward, you know, outside looking in that makes assumptions about yes. people that it becomes maybe the point of the story. Mm-hmm. So we're misjudging uh, George Smythe in the same way that we've been misjudging Aunt Agatha, and we are all misjudging all these poor relations yes. that we're constantly talking about. And that just hit me where the first paragraph was probably after she wrote this story down, she was like, oh, mm-hmm. you know what? This is what I learned from the story. But for some reason, I'm going to put it in the front yeah. so that you know it the whole time. Yeah. There's a circular morality tale to yes. it. So, like, the upshot, the punchline is that the poor relations of us probably end up having a much more, you know, pleasant life than yeah. we might be expecting. Like, we might be calling them the poor John or poor Mary, but they're actually, you know, Just not fine. poor at all. They're, they're wealthy in ways that you, you jealous gossipy person can never actually understand yes exactly and i think that's the the learning point of this story and the other thing about Catherine lord is because her husband passed away she has written the stories about infants dying and she wrote stories about the partners dying um, whether it was the mother or the father or the parents but this one has that death in it as well but i feel like or i wonder if she's like oh this one is going to be just fine, but it'll always have that line of suspense. Mm-hmm. And you'll always be waiting for it, and then I just won't put it in there, and it'll be a happy ending. And it's like, whoa. Yeah, so it's actually... Okay, so so on there, there's two ways of thinking about this, I think. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, if you're watching TV, mm-hmm. 
here watching your little short little soap opera shows. The happy ending sort of expected in a sitcom. Yes. Right? Like everything's going to end up just fine. And in the sense that disposable media tends to do that yeah. because the point of the story isn't to like give you profound philosophical thoughts. It's to entertain you yeah. for half an hour. Mm -hmm. And so there's one way of thinking about this short story as doing that thing, where this is simply to be diverting. This is the kind of thing that you would read in a parlor. Mm -hmm. The suspense line is, isn't is really that suspenseful because, you know, there's no murders. Mm -hmm. There's no the worst crime that happens is a bad check. Mm -hmm. And so it's an appropriate sort of short story that you and your grandmother and your niece, your baby child, can read together mm -hmm. in the parlor, and it's fine. But then there's the sophisticated element of that fact that that suspense is there. Yes. So like the understanding of what the audience expects is embedded in the story. So we know, having read other periodicals, yes. what the story's supposed to do. We know that Mr. Smythe is supposed to end up being like a Beauty and the Beast beast character um, or like a Bluebeard yeah. sort of um, figure. And the fairy tale is going to end with somebody dying. Yes. Like that's how, or like Aunt Agatha being pitiless and mm -hmm. whatever else. And, and the narrator and so because, being thrown off the property. <laughs> right. Like the whole family is going to go into ruin because they let Aunt Agatha go to Italy once. But it, it doesn't happen. And so Catherine Lord is playing with your expectations and using those expectations as the suspense line so that you as a reader are like drawn through the story yes. like you can't turn away yes. because you know what's about to happen and it never actually ends up doing that yep. so there's this sort of delayed not delayed gratification what i mean it's the the expectations of the of the genre that you're reading are violated in such a fashion as to make the story itself interesting yes yep. so it's it's the reason um, not giving you what you want as a reader is the reason that you end up reading the whole story, yes. which is crazy, yep. like complicated thing that is happening right there. And so it's not disposable media. It's actually a really complicated and yeah. well thought through structural component of what the story is doing. So that happy ending is sort of slyly mocking the audience yes. for expecting the bad ending or for maybe desiring the bad ending. Mm -hmm. So it's actually quite a fascinating structure that she's built into this story. Yeah, it's really cool. I, it's really complex. We already said that the learning point of the story was at the beginning of the book. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't judge people to be poor. <laughs> don't be don't be rude. Yeah, <laughs> That's basically it. Pretty much. Don't make assumptions about other people's marriages. Yeah, exactly. Very good point. Yes, <laughs> very good. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Lovely to see you. Good to see you. Great to chat as always. Yeah. And you have a great day. Thanks. You have a good one too, and I'll schedule the next one another time. Mm -hmm.